less NATE, transactions. Transactions allow you to define a unit of activity that will be considered atomic, all or nothing. The data will be considered consistent at the beginning of the transaction and at the end. Locks are obtained to isolate data resources, preventing other processes from performing incompatible activities against those resources. You can control the degree of isolation of your transaction by specifying an isolation level. Part 1, What are Transactions? Transactions allow you to define the boundaries of activity that will be considered atomic. You do so by enclosing the statements that you want to participate in the transaction in a begin tran, commit tran block. Note that in SQL Server the default behavior is to consider a statement that does not appear in an explicit transaction block to be its own transaction, as if you enclosed that statement alone in a begin tran, commit tran block. To demonstrate the different aspects of working with transactions, I'll use the tables T1 and T2, which you create and populate in the car transactions database by running this code. As a basic example, this code is used to insert statements in a single transaction. Part 2, Locking and Blocking Locks provide the isolation aspect of transactions. They are acquired on data resources to prevent data inconsistency problems. SQL Server allows you to control the level of consistency you get from your data by setting the isolation level of your session or query. Locks can be obtained on resources at different granularity levels of data. The smallest granularity of data is the row level. To demonstrate a blocking scenario, open three connections. Run this code in connection 1 to open a transaction and update a row in table T1. Run the following code in connection 2 to attempt to select all rows from T1. Connection 2 needs a shared lock to read the data, but it cannot obtain one because an exclusive lock is held by connection 1 on one of the rows. Connection 2 is blocked. The system tran locks view gives you information about locks.
query the SysDM exec connections view to obtain information about the connections involved in the conflict. Query the SysDM exec sessions view to obtain information about the sessions involved in the conflict. Query the view to obtain information about blocked requests. The SysDM exec connections view contains a binary handle that you can provide to the function SysDM exec SQL text to get the code text of the last request. To terminate the transaction in connection 1 without committing the change, issue a rollback. Part 3, Isolation Levels Isolation levels allow you to control the consistency level that you will get when manipulating data, bearing in mind that multiple processes might be running concurrently. SQL Server 2008 gives you four isolation levels based on locking and blocking that implement a pessimistic concurrency model, read uncommitted, read committed, repeatable read, and serializable, and two isolation levels based on row versioning that implement an optimistic model, snapshot and read committed snapshot. Part 4, Read Uncommitted When working with the read uncommitted isolation level, readers do not request shared locks. Thus, they're never in conflict with sessions that modified data. That is, they can read data that is locked exclusively, and they do not interfere with processes that modified data. Of course, at this level readers might get uncommitted changes. Read uncommitted is the worst isolation level in terms of consistency but the best in terms of concurrency. from connection 1, issue the following code, which updates call 2 to version 2 within a transaction and retrieves the modified column values, keeping the transaction open. You get version 2 as the output. From connection 2, set the session's isolation level to read uncommitted, and read the data. Even though another transaction changed the data and had not committed yet, you are able to see the uncommitted change, you get the output version 2. From connection 1, issue a rollback. If at this point you read the call to value from the row where key call is equal to 2, you will get B back. Part 5, Read Committed Read Committed is the default isolation level of SQL Server. In this isolation level, processes request a shared lock to read data and release it as soon as the data has been read, not when the statement or the transaction finishes. This means that dirty reads cannot happen, the only changes you can read are those that have been committed. 
However, all other concurrency related problems can happen with this isolation level. You get the output version too, because you can read your own changes, of course. Now try to read the data from connection 2, working in the read committed isolation level. You will be blocked. Commit the change in connection 1. Connection 1 releases the exclusive lock, and connection 2 gets version 2 back, which is the committed state of the value after the change. Part 6, Repeatable Read Processes working with the repeatable read isolation level also request a shared lock when reading data, meaning that dirty reads cannot occur at this level. But unlike with read committed, at the repeatable read level transactions keep shared locks until they are terminated. You are guaranteed to get repeatable reads, consistent analysis, because no other process is able to obtain an exclusive lock in between your reads. To demonstrate a case in which you get consistent analysis when working at the repeatable read level, run the following code from connection 1. You get the output version 1, and the process keeps a shared lock on the data because the transaction is still open. If you attempt to modify the data from connection 2, you will be blocked. Read the data again in connection 1, and then commit. You still get version 1 back. When the transaction committed, the shared lock was released, and connection 2 could obtain the exclusive lock it needed to update the data. Part 7, Serializable The serializable isolation level is similar to repeatable read, with an additional facet, active transactions acquire key range locks, placed on indexes, based on query filters. This applies not only to readers, but also to writers. Obtaining a key range lock is as if you logically lock all data that meets the query's filter. You not only lock whatever data was physically found when you accessed it, but you also lock data that does not exist yet that would happen to meet your queries filter. This level adds the prevention of phantoms to the list of problems repeatable read handles. To demonstrate the prevention of phantoms with the serializable isolation level, first create an index on t1.col1. Then run the following code from connection 1. Next, from connection 2, attempt to introduce a phantom row, a O that meets the filter of the query submitted by connection 1. You will be blocked. Back in connection 1, run the following code to read the qualifying rows again and commit the transaction. Now that the transaction has been committed, the key range lock is released, 
and the transaction in connection to managers to insert the row. Part 8, Save Points. SQL Server supports save points, which allow you to undo some partial activity within a transaction. To do so, you need to mark a save point by issuing a save tran save point name greater than statement and later issue a rollback tran save point name greater than to undo the activity that was performed as of that save point. The stored procedures code issues a begin tran statement so that it can define a save point. The code defines the save point S1 and inserts a row into the sequence table, generating a new identity value. The code continues by assigning the newly generated identity value, via the scope identity function, to the output parameter at val. The code then issues a rollback to the save point S1. The rollback will not affect an external transaction if one was open when the procedure was invoked, because it reverts to the save point. The code finally issues a commit tran statement that doesn't have any changes to commit, but just terminates the begin tran statement. Part 9, Deadlocks Deadlocks occur when two or more processes block each other such that they enter a blocking chain that cannot be resolved without the system's intervention. Without intervention, processes involved in a deadlock have to wait indefinitely for one another to relinquish their locks. Issue this code from connection 1. This code opened a new transaction and modified a row in T1. Issue the following code from connection 2, which updates a row in T2. Issue this code from connection 1, which attempts to read data from T2. The select query is blocked. Next, issue the following code from connection 2, attempting to query the data from T1. At this point, the two processes enter a deadlock, because each is waiting for the other to release its locks. SQL Server intervenes, terminating the transaction in one of the connections. Do you want to learn new skills in the fastest and most effective way? Visit Learn with Video Tutorials.com